This is Julian and I'm here in the Hollywood Hills in Los Angeles and what we're going to jump right into here is a very special video that I filmed with best-selling author Robert Greene. I met up with him two weeks ago to discuss his new book The Laws of Human Nature and we just had so much fun that we decided to record this more candid video. Just shooting some ideas back and forth. You're absolutely going to love it. So sit back and enjoy. The other thing you mentioned earlier that I liked was the sense of that we've, we're programmed. Mm. That we're not really independent and autonomous as we think we are. And what are we programmed by? We're programmed by our childhood and by early influences like we discussed earlier with our parents that create yeah. certain patterns. We're programmed by our teachers and peers who told us who we are, oh, you're too shy, or you're like this, or you're like that. We, they, they define who we are. We're programmed by society and all the, conform, the, the social f forces that we feel to conform to what makes a, a very pleasant, uh, politically correct person. These forces are programming us. We're not who we are. We're not who we think we are. We're not an individual. Yeah. We're compelled by other forces beyond us to become this kind of mask that we wear. And by confronting yourself, by knowing who you are, knowing who you deeply are, including the dark qualities and including the good qualities, is a way to deprogram yourself. And that's yeah. another way of looking at this. Yeah, that can be like really trippy to reflect on like, what is authentic? Because you could even, like you said, your personality, is it authentic or is it personality you crafted in a reaction to different events? even your thoughts and beliefs, like what is actually you versus what you took on, you know? Um, even the actions that we take on a day-to-day -day basis, like how much is actually proactive? Like what most people do is they wake up, they, they, they're slowly waking up, first thing they do is they, they reach for their phone and immediately they see all the notifications, emails, and now they're acting in reaction to this. And then something triggers them and then they'll text someone like, how could you? And then that comes back and then they're reacting to that. Then they're late for work and it's always this constant chain of reaction. Right. And I do believe this is also a big reason it's so hard to create change. It's like we all have the knowledge. For example, say someone is not in the best shape physically. They all know, okay, going to the gym, changing my diet. So they have that knowledge, but there's no space in their life to inject that proactivity because there's this constant chain of reaction that's running them and they're not actually living an authentic life. Like if you're not happy, it's like everything you're doing is in reaction to something and it could be apparent on the surface, like seeing a notification or as you said, going back to what was programmed into you, going back to your childhood, trauma, different patterns, and then just being a slave to that. Well, one of the points in the book is to question yourself and to question your emotions. So if you feel angry or you feel excited by something, just don't act on it, but step back and go, why am I excited by this particular individual? Why am I angry at this situation? And in analyzing your own emotions, you realize that maybe you don't really need to feel that way, or you could feel something different, or you could move beyond it. I meditate every morning. I've been doing this for about eight years now. And as I'm meditating, thoughts will come up, will bubble up constantly. I'm trying to empty my mind. Thoughts will bubble up. And the first thing I do is, where does that thought come from? And so many times I realize I'm, I, have, I have been programmed to think this certain way. I have been programmed to feel angry in this situation. I have been programmed to constantly feel anxious about whether people are liking me or not liking me. And so in confronting this element that it's not me who's governing many of these emotions, I'm able to take some distance and perhaps mm. get out of some of these patterns. Yeah. You don't accept the emotions that you feel. Question why you're feeling that way. And always look internally, because it's so easy to point the finger like, where does this come from? He did something that pisses me off. She did something that pisses me off. It's because of that. Our immediate reaction, you know, whenever we're triggered, and I love you mentioned that in the book, it's like something takes over. You know, like a person, a situation triggers us is to obsess of the person. It's like that person, this thing, so on and so forth. And there's a famous saying in the spiritual world where it's like, don't shoot the messenger. Like that person, that situation was the messenger that triggered something inside of you. Instead of obsessing over the messenger, find out what was triggered inside of you. Right. Where did that come from? Look right. for the message. And in reality, be thankful for 
the person or situation that triggered you because now it creates more self-awareness. Right. Because a lot of those, you could say, early traumatic experiences or what's at the source of some of the patterns in our life, it's close to impossible to be aware of it. Right. You know, there's that saying, um, there's what you know, there's what you don't know, and there's what you don't know you don't know, which is right. down there. Right. So it gives you uh, like a glimpse, like some of that came closer up to the surface. You can even see it. Like we talked a lot about reading people. You can see it in people like when they're not just run in the moments, because what about someone who's just constantly run? You know, we see it like when there's heightened triggers, like something upsets you and it just takes over. But some people just like live in that space where they're not even there anymore. And you just see like that consciousness kind of just retracting and just being gone. And it's like this triggered energy or, or triggered, you could say, parasite that kind of takes over and that's what's running them. Like, give me an example of something like that. Like say someone who's, Here's an example. Someone gets really triggered and they like they just keep looping on it and just fueling it to the point where it's like that's all they know. Or someone who gets triggered and starts numbing that part of themselves and they just need more and more to numb to the point where there's just very little of them left. There's very little, you could say, humanity left. And you'll see it. It's just like this vacant shell of a person. Well, the thing is, the thing that I wrote about in the book uh, and psychologists have written is that negative emotions can be very addicting mm -hmm. and, you know, they can sustain us much like a kind of a rush of adrenaline. Yeah. So I talk in the book about aggressive people, uh, people who are kind of toxically aggressive and sort of, you know, make, create a lot of enemies. Um, what we don't realize is that they get pleasure from being aggressive from pushing people around, from manipulating, from humiliating. Uh, we've all dealt with bosses, I have, who um, actually love to humiliate their employees mm -hmm. and make them feel like nothing they do is right. And we think, what a miserable bastard, you know, how can he live with himself? But in fact, it's an addiction. It's a rush of energy. It's a rush of, I have control over this person. Mm -hmm. And by giving them that by allowing them to be aggressive by feeding their aggression we feed their addiction so any kind of negative emotion like anger and we see this online with people who are always ranting and always outraged okay. is you are addicted to that emotion it makes you feel alive it gives you a what i call a false sense of purpose mm. and it doesn't satisfy you or fulfill you in any way how many times can you vent your anger and spleen online at somebody for being such an idiot and where it's ever going to make you feel happy and fulfilled that you got it out? You never feel satisfied. You have to do it again and again and again. We were talking about how, you know, some people could have resistance to this type of book. And it's true, it confronts them. But the other, you could say, underlying message is a positive message of change. Like it'll change their life. It doesn't, it, it adds hope as opposed to fueling to that discontent and right. outrage and anger, as opposed to, you could say a book like, here's how you're being screwed over, and here's how you can screw people back. Right, like right. people like gravitate towards right. that, or like the news or clickbait. Like even a video like this, if I title it like, you know, Julian and Robert Greene like discuss, you know, the, the benefits of the laws of human nature. It'll be cool, people will click on it, but it won't be nearly as many clicks as this is how society is screwing you over, right. or, or Robert dishes the dirt on Julian, or Julian dishes the dirt on Robert. Everyone will click on that because it's fueling that same we're, addiction. We're dishing the dirt on the audience. I know, the audience. dishes the dirt on the audience. <laughs> the first time it kind of also like came up in my awareness was during the election. I don't know if you followed, like there was, <laughs> everyone followed, I don't know if you followed that one. Um, but there was a point, I was talking with a friend of mine, and it's like, we knew Donald Trump was going to win because he was preying on that fear, on that outrage, as opposed to a message of more like hope. Like, here's how things will be happy. It's like, this is what we're going to do. This is happening. And everyone's like, there's that fuel, you know, where people who won, like, liked them or there was that discontent, wanted him to win. But then even people who hated them or hated him um, probably also got a bit out of it because now there's that constant outrage of him being around. If he wasn't around, they wouldn't have that, that person to just constantly hate. So he preyed on that fear. That's again, the media, the outrage, the anger, and it's yeah, like yeah. pushing our buttons, fueling us.
Yeah, well, yeah. we humans have a, a, a negative bias, which I attribute to how we evolved. Um, when, when we were these weak little hominid creatures roaming around the savannas of East Africa, mm. um, and leopards were preying on us and other tribes, um, our survival depended on our ability to see the potential danger and the worst case scenario in each situation. So we were programmed to feel fearful and anxious and be attentive to all the possible negative consequences around us in our environment. Mm -hmm. This is programmed deep, deep in our nature so that um, we are actually more attracted towards the negative picture of something than the positive picture of something. And um, so, yeah, obviously Trump honed in on that and is a marketing genius when it comes to that. You see it in a lot of advertisement, particularly back in the heyday of Madison Avenue, was appeal to your fears and your insecurities about life. Mm. If you don't have this product, you have BO or bad breath, or you're not, people aren't gonna like you if you don't buy this car. So appealing to the negative has much more power often than appealing to the positive. The other fascinating thing about what programs us is um, what I like to call like core beliefs or um, core assumptions or your core identity where, you know, when you're, you're born, you have to quickly form your bearings of what this world is. Like, what is this? And like, get a feel for it. And right. of course, you can learn through firsthand experience where, you know, you touch something, you're like, okay, it's solid. But a lot of it's through secondhand. And you're going to be looking at, you know, authority figures, like whoever's raising you, your teachers, right, right, society, right. common beliefs, and you just take those on. Right. And those early beliefs or core beliefs serve as the foundation of all the other beliefs you build on that. Right. So it's like, say you try to become successful and there's a negative outcome. You might believe that, okay, if I become successful, success equals bad or success equals I'm alone or success equals I'm abandoned or disapproved of and I lose my friends. And you form that core assumption and then you start living your life forming beliefs on that. And also part of you is looking for data and events that reinforce that right, assumption. Right. So it's at the foundation of all these new beliefs and then you form new beliefs on that. It's like a tree with a foundation. And then we just keep repeating these patterns and there's massive resistance to becoming aware of it or even daring to question it because if this is wrong, everything crumbles That's right. and you lose part of that map. And we have that with our identity. Like one question I love, I mean asking myself and asking people is, if you could pick one movie character that is you, that you resonate with, what movie character is that? For me, for many years, it was the self-destructive artist. That was me. And looking at it, I could just see the patterns, how it just ran my life, like creating some success, but I could never allow myself to truly make it for I was no longer self-destructive. Mm -hmm. And in that character, there's, there's ceilings of what you think you deserve, what's too good for you, what you're allowed to have. And that's at the foundation, like this identity I've taken on from a very young age and that just I've invested in that I've become um, a lot of people are the underdog where they can't like a lot of procrastination they put things off until there's this huge challenge that they can finally overcome or if right. people believe in them they don't like it they right. like slowly slacking off so people start doubting them and then they can prove them wrong right you know so looking at those core beliefs I'm like wow like what character are you are you the hero the sidekick um, Spider-Man waiting for like that magical moment that spider to bite you for things to change and then you just look at your life you're like wow like I think I'm in control but I'm just being run right. by you know what happened in my childhood how I interpreted that the beliefs the assumptions I made right. and I'm a slave to that until I become aware of it that's right you know yeah um, there have been all sorts of interesting studies I'm, I'm kind of connecting this indirectly but it's called the Pygmalion effect in psychology, mm -hmm. where um, they'll take students at a very early age, and if they t tell students, you know, um, basically, we believe I believe that you're destined for higher education, for college, you're really smart, you've got a, incredible tools, then they sort of internalize that, and they work harder, and they become smarter. And they've done studies where even the teacher doesn't say anything, but they're, they're told to say that they feel that their students are smart and deserving of it. And the students pick that up. 
and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So if your teachers were telling you at a very early age that, oh, you're not really smart, you come from a, mm. a family background, or you're poor, or you don't, you're not going to become president, or you're not smart enough, you internalize that judgment, and it becomes, you carry that with you your entire life. And you never really get over that, and you're constantly doubting. You don't think of yourself as somebody who could be greater, or could have this, or who could be really smart and, and understand books. So, just simple evaluations of teachers when you were five or six years old can have this inordinate impact on how you look at yourself later in life. Mm. So, you can be the product of how other people have judged you when you were very young. And the only way out of that trap is to look back and examine where your own, as you call them, core beliefs come from. Why do I feel this way? Question yourself. You know, they have the famous bumper sticker, question authority. Mm. Okay, I'm saying question yourself. Question why you feel this way, why you feel inferior, why you feel you don't deserve this, why you feel you are great and deserve so much more. Question, question, question. Don't accept and assume. That's funny. What I always say is question the original assumption. Instead of assuming this is true and acting from there, why do I assume that's true? I'm not enough, then what? Why do I believe I'm not enough? What is keeping that alive? People can have the opposite problem as well. They're told by their parents, you're great. You're a prince or a princess. You're, you're just the most wonderful little child on the planet. And then you grow up and you think that you are this wonderful person. And everything you touch is just golden and wonderful. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's not. And then you either become extremely depressed or you become very grandiose. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've all encountered people like that, the spoiled child who has no relationship to reality. So that's another way where you can be programmed in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. You know, and we find, I, believe me, I have nothing against millennials. I love millennials a lot. They're wonderful people, but there are more of those kind of spoiled mentality mm -hmm. than among my generation, which has many faults. Believe me, I'm kind of a uh, in the Generation X boomer category, and I am not fond of my own generation, so I have nothing against millennials. But there is more of that kind of slightly s pampered, yeah. uh, spoiled mentality. Of, I am so wonderful. I deserve great things from the world. I'm entitled, you know, sort mm -hmm. of thing. So you can be programmed in that way as well and cause other problems in life. A human being has to have a sense of purpose. The feeling of no purpose is suicidal. So what people do is they create a false sense of purpose. The false sense of purpose will be attention. If I get so much attention from people and so much recognition, then I... I'm fulfilled. But then you can never realize that. You can never get enough attention. Other people say money. Mm -hmm. If I make enough money, man, I'm going to have be happy. But we see how many people get to that point and they're not fulfilled and they're miserable. They're and more they're obsessed soulless. with it too. Yeah. And then there's the fear of losing it. I, I read the biography for this book of Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis. Fascinating. And she was married later in life to Aristotle Onassis the wealthiest man in the world at the time. He was the most miserable, screwed up man you'd ever, you know, there was nothing great in his life. He had all the money, but it wasn't enough. You know, there are other things. It can be addictions, it could be drugs, mm -hmm. or it could be a cause, you know. Make America great again. If I join this cause, I can get over, I can feel like I'm, I have a purpose. I'm joining all these other people and moving in this direction, but it's false. These are not real because it doesn't come from within. You as an individual, as Julian Blanc, you had a purpose in life. You had something you were meant to achieve because you have a unique DNA, unique genetics, and unique parents, a unique experience. Something about you is truly original and weird. And to the degree that you mine that weirdness and your uniqueness, you can become fulfilled. You can create something beautiful and lasting. That is a real sense of purpose because it comes from something deep within you. Mm -hmm. But so many people f pursue these sort of false sense of purposes. And you can tell the difference between the two in that in following the right sense of purpose, the one that you were meant to in discovering your calling in life, which you were meant to achieve, you have moments of fulfillment. 
you have moments where, yeah, I had a great podcast. Yeah, I wrote this great book. And you can move on and you can live like that. And then when you die, you don't feel like you wasted your life. A false sense of purpose, you never have enough. It's never enough attention. It's never enough money. It's never enough of that anger from the cause, etc. I played guitar when I was younger. That was actually my first path to mastery. And um, what I realized, like when I started composing for the first time, I was actually 12 and I'm like, I want to compose. And I had no idea how to compose. And then I really got into it and I played for many years. And when something kind of kicks in, like out of inspiration, and you're just like, wow, this is going to be amazing. There was that fulfillment in the moment. There was a knowing that, of course, the song would be complete. Then I'd record it. People would hear it, et cetera, et cetera. But there was not that rush. It was like, I'm enjoying every step. I know it's going to be great, but there's no need to get in the future. It's kind of like this constant just being with it as opposed to, I can't wait for people to hear it. The end, like the destination is what gets me what I want as opposed right. to like this destination thinking as opposed to the whole process. Right. And then you can even shift that into the way that you live your life. It's like, are you living in this state where it's like always a better future, always a better future? And in a way, pro programming yourself to thinking better future, better future, better future, which is endless right. as opposed to everything's awesome now. How can I get better than this? How can everything get better than this? And being surprised every step of the way. Right. Um, there was a quote from this book called The Presence Process that I loved. It's, um, he said, it's a state of continued ripening. That's uh -huh. what I love. It's like just getting better and better and better, but there's no rush to get in the future. Right, I you love know? that. That's great. Yeah. I hope you enjoyed a little bit more of a part candid two. part two chat here. If you missed the first video, I'll put a link to it here below. Check out his book, The Laws of Human Nature, a true masterpiece. Link here below as well. And thanks again. Thanks a lot, Julian. Thank you. Bye.